Okay, we are recording. Cool, so networking, there's been a little bit of activity on the spec repo, um, a minor adjustment to the NR uh, requirements. Um, there's a discussion on the um, a ping, uh, which we can kind of like share vital information or at least let the other know that there's vital information that has changed while at the same time saying I'm still alive. Um, so that's still a kind of work in progress PR for discussion. We might talk about that a little bit today. Um, and it has certainly come to my attention after a few conversations that um, aggregation strategy, although looks relatively straightforward to implement, there's a lot of kind of edge cases and things to think through to make sure you get this right. Um, so I want to kind of talk about where everyone's at, uh, talk about explicitly some of these problems and see if there's anything else that we want to make it into the stack, even if it's just guidance. Um, cool. But we will start with updates and uh, Raul from Protocol Labs is here. Raul, you want to get started? Hey, yeah. Hey, hi, everybody. I hope everybody is, is safe and sound and everybody is fine wherever they are. Uh, for us, we've been working really hard on Gossip Sub in the last few weeks. Uh, if you have been following the libby 2 b Specs repo, the Go libby 2 b Pop Sub repos, you will have seen a bunch of changes and a bunch of discussion and PRs and so on around Gossip Sub hardening. Um, we are evolving the Gossip Sub. Um, protocol although there are no substantial protocol level changes um in fact gossip sub 1.0 and gossip sub 1.1 um which is how we're calling this evolution uh 1.1 is a set of security extensions and it's basically 1.0 and 1.1 are compatible with each other so it's perfectly feasible for implementations uh, across different languages that are uh, supporting different levels of the protocol to 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 cooperate and to work with one another. Uh, basically, what has happened over the last few weeks is that we assembled a cross-functional team here at Protocol Labs between the B2B, the Receiver Networks Lab, who is represented here today by the Dios, who joined this call, uh, Filecoin, and Testground. Uh, this was an internal cross-functional team, and basically what we did was enumerate and reason through a number of attacks and their feasibility uh, and the cost of, of those attacks and the potential impact um, in Gossip So 1.0. We designed a number of mitigation mechanisms and basically we hardened the Go implementation, taking this one as a reference implementation uh, by introducing uh, some of those mechanisms. Um, and they are things like peer scoring, gray listing, back offs, and other elements to secure the protocol. We're going to be posting the links to the spec itself, which has already been merged to master. Let's just find the right place. Okay, there you go. So there's a link to the spec, um, which um, is a document in itself. So as I said, it's conceived as an extension uh, to the baseline spec. And there's a PR. Uh, that implements these changes on the reference implementation. It's a work in progress PR and it's been actively reviewed by, by a bunch of us. And I totally invite everybody on this call to uh, go into the spec, to read the spec, to comment on the spec, um, and, and also on the PR itself. Um, what else, what else, what else? Yeah, okay, next steps. Um, basically, right now we have a team of three people that are dedicated entirely to testing the effect of our changes against the baseline of 1.0. So we are building, uh, we're using test ground for this, and we're building a number of attacks and coding a number of attacks, modeling a number of attacks, and testing them against the 1.0 implementation and the 1.1 implementation. Once um, the right moment comes, we'll release all of this information and the numbers and the improvements uh, to the public. Right now, it's sensitive. Um, and yeah, over the next few days, um, there is an internal red team here at Protocol Labs that we've assembled that will be auditing the spec and the implementation. And I think that once that checkpoint is over, that would be the safe moment to, to basically throw these changes over the fence for other language implementations to adopt. So um, JVM, NIM, JS, Rust, and basically, uh, you know, we are here at the disposal of everybody else to support this work, to support the implementation, the upgrade work, 
in whatever uh, manner is needed, right? Knowledge, funding, whatever. So we can we can talk about that. Uh, also in parallel, we're going to be looking at um, at potentially hiring a an external audit firm as well. So open to to suggestions from from you guys if you have any. That's all from me. I think I extended myself too much. Awesome. Thanks, Raul. Um, would you estimate this is, in terms of the development side, two days of work, a week of work, two weeks of work to get up to spec? Uh, to get up to spec, I think um, it shouldn't, it definitely shouldn't be, given, given the fact that, so basically what we're doing is we have the reference implementation, the uh, in the next few days, we're going to be annotating, enhancing, and even refactoring some parts of the reference implementation to make to make them modelic, so that you know it's very easy to like go through and actually understand how things relate to the spec. Uh, there's a bunch of like algorithmic stuff here that needs to like very clearly be you know cross-linked to the spec itself. So hopefully, it would be super digestible. The spec and the reference implementation themselves, the the the, the pair of those, I would expect magnitude of days it's is not a huge it's yeah, it's okay. not a refactor it's not a rewrite it's a bunch of uh and if you implemented it with the right hooks which is the way that we've done it we've um implemented it with a set of like callbacks and, and a number of things you can very easily plug into the right places within gossip sub itself to inform the scorer which then can run kind of like in a decoupled fashion so um right. yeah i would say magnitude of days cool thank you um, any questions for Raul? Great. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate all the work there. Exciting. Um, Felix, do you have anything uh, you want to update on, on Discovery 5 or otherwise? Uh, yeah, uh, so the Go implementation is now up as a pull request on Go Ethereum repo. Uh, I've been uh, I've implemented a new LRU based session cache for it, so it doesn't it no longer stores keys in the uh, on disk. Um, and uh, in general, we've reviewed it uh, with the Go Ethereum team. Uh, I do need to make some further changes to uh, reduce the time the unit tests take because right now the unit tests take about uh, sixty seconds and. Uh, Previously, discovery unit tests took about 10 seconds, so I need to uh, reduce the test time. And um, yeah, uh, other than that, uh, we are positive it can go in very soon. Uh, we have also uh, identified a couple of things that should definitely go into the next spec version. So um, looking at the issues right now, um, uh, uh, Dimitri from the uh, one of the Java teams. I keep forgetting what this client is called. Sorry. Um, Harmony is uh, has uh, proposed that we should uh, change the definition of the find node packet to be uh, uh, yeah to not require so many individual uh, requests. So we will convert it to have some kind of like to basically accept multiple distances in a single request. And doing that will basically reduce the number of requests required during a lookup. And um, we have also identified the problem with the uh, tag construction that is in every packet um, because uh, there is a type confusion there. So nodes can, under some circumstances, uh, misidentify a packet which they receive and this basically leads to a situation where you get a lot of ugly messages in the log I mean there's basically there's no there's no big danger there it's just something that is easily avoided if we change the format a little bit and we had some ideas and discussed it so these are the two most pressing things I think for the next iteration of the spec would be to oh yeah and then there's one final thing that Yannick uh, suggested which is to potentially use compressed um, compressed um, elliptic curve keys in the handshake. So this would save something like 32 bytes uh, for every handshake in the, in the packet size. So I think it's worth doing, but it's a backwards and compatible change. So it will have, it will go in the next spec version. 
Yeah, so I'm going to be busy updating uh, my implementation with these things to see if everything is still working and I'll create the next spec version over, yeah, probably uh, this week and, and I'll notify everyone and then we can just, yeah, keep improving. Thanks, Felix. Questions? Um, let's see. Any other updates? Uh, not really. Yeah, thanks. And otherwise, uh, from anyone else, any other updates? So, uh, for uh, testing, um, Raul and others were talking earlier about more like the lower level testing. Meanwhile, uh, Laxman and me are looking into this network testing somewhere between like your application level and this tower level testing. So we have uh, Rumor and Pyroom. I shared these links earlier. And those are evolving. And the Python wrapper is getting very like integrated with the PySpec so that we can produce all these consensus messages uh, to send to clients. Uh, from these network tests and then start some initial sync test uh, proof of concepts. Um, so this is all being worked on. Um, Laxman is new, uh, he's helping us part-time um, and he has this repository up called Stethoscope. Um, if anyone is interested in helping, giving feedback to like proof of concept testing uh, for sync tests for example, then um, please reach out, we can discuss these tests. But it's still early and I don't think I want to bother every client with early phase testing right now. Cool, thanks Proto. Proto is also now using Rumor, Pyroom, and a modified version of the Python spec to pull down uh, to sync the lighthouse testnet. It's pretty cool. Right. So within a little bit less than ten minutes, um, I think nine minutes something, and BOS disabled. BOS is still bottlenecked by them. Um, the spec can sync the ten thousand slots of lighthouse testnet, which is kind of fun to check that it actually works. And you can load your own configuration, and this is on version 0 0.10.1. So I think everyone on that version can try it out for themselves and sync their testnet, check if transitions match. And generally useful to have some network tooling to be able to interact with your node that also can produce consensus messages rather easily. So if you want to script your own test or want to script your own health uh, monitoring or, or something, you can do that. Cool. Okay, other updates? Okay. We'll move on. Um, okay, so as I mentioned at the beginning, um, some challenges and edge cases in the aggregation strategy and discovery and subnets, um, I think have been on a few teams' minds. Um, specifically, speaking with age, uh, he wanted to make sure that everyone was on the same page and that we were kind of hitting, uh, making sure this was secure and hitting all these edge cases. Um, to that end, I will give the floor to Age if he wants to kind of discuss his um, experience thus far and some of the issues that he's run into. Age? Uh, yeah, sure. So I, I'm not sure how far all the teams are into uh, implementing the naive attestation aggregation strategy, uh, but we've we've hit a few issues that I've talked with various teams about. So. 
um, maybe other people have some answers or have kind of made progress in each of these areas. So it uh, might be a good chance to have a chat about them. Um, I guess, so some of the main things that we've had to think about is discovery. We need discovery to be relatively quickly, uh, relatively fast. So uh, we've spent a bit of time trying to, uh, I guess, tweak our disk our disk v5 implementation so that we can find peers quickly uh, we need to find peers because um, when we obviously when we need to subscribe to particular subnets we need to have peers to be able to subscribe to um, we spend a bit of time looking at the validator client to beacon node api because uh, with the new spec updates there's um, you know there's obviously changes in that api specifically uh, around getting the validator client to know who's an aggregator as well as the beacon node to know who is an aggregator. So uh, we've made some changes there. So I'm curious to know if any other teams have actually modified this API to see, because we, we've kind of gone off on our own little tangent and potentially we can still conform there. Maybe some people have some good design kind of decisions there. Uh, there's difficulty we had, well, I guess it's not difficulty, you just kind of have to sit down and, and solve the problem that you have to deal with the timing uh, quite uh, quite thoroughly with uh, being able to firstly discover peers and then subscribe to his particular particular subnets for a, a given future slot and committee. Um, and if you have many validators attached to you, you kind of have to deal with that. Um, one of the other issues is peer management. Um, I've kind of been this is one of the one of the bigger issues I think that I've kind of been bringing up with everyone uh, when we have uh, when we need to be able to find peers to be able to connect to subnets, we need to know, uh, firstly, the peers that we're connected to, what long-lived subnets they, can, they, they have. Uh, this, this involves knowing the ENR of the peers that we're connected to. Um, so we don't actually have a mechanism for finding that out if a peer is connected to us through the libp2p stack. Uh, so that's, that's one of the issues that we came across. Uh, another one, I just, I don't want to just kind of throw all these things out there, but um, another one that I've just recently kind of run into is that uh, if we are an aggregator for a, a particular slot or subnet, uh, rather, if we're not an aggregator, should we subscribe to the subnet? Uh, if we're not an ag aggregator, I don't think we actually need to uh, actually receive any of the attestations on the subnet. We can just, uh, we can just publish across the fan out. So I'm curious. Uh, if we do do that, then there's less people overall subscribe, but we should have the backbone from the long lived subnets. Um, I guess that's just a, a small list off the top of my head of some of the things we've run into. I'm curious to hear if anyone else has thought about these or run into any of these issues. Um, for the API, I can comment on that. So in the older spec, it's basically just one trip, right? Validator sends the selection proof to the beacon node, and beacon node verifies that this is. Um, um, we can now verify that the validator is actually the aggregator at the right slot and then package all the attestation together, broadcast the aggregated um, selection object. But in the latest spec, there's um, the, in the latest spec, the um, aggregator ha ha has to sign over the aggregated object. So, you, so then it becomes a two way trip. Validator sends the selection proof. Um, we can now respond back with the, um, Ag aggregated object and then the validator signs it over and then send it back to the beacon node and then the beacon node broadcasts the object over to the um, net network at this that's my experience so far uh sure so if you guys have an api be interested to have a look at it um some of the the small i guess edge cases are that we're signing a future slot and this line is based on the signings based on a fork so in principle if you're signing an epoch in advance you could have a fork change uh in between in between actually having to do any kind of attestation and this the, the slot signature that you have um, another thing we ran into is that uh i think uh, marin brought this up is that potentially you want to give the option for different beacon nodes to actually do the the aggregation so if you're connected to three beacon nodes you, you probably only want to use one of them to actually send the aggregation off. So we, we uh, engineered, I guess, a way for when you do the subscription that the beacon node tells you whether you're an aggregator or not. So that it's up to the validator client to actually ping the, the beacon. I don't want to get into the technicalities, I guess, uh, probably better offline. 
Um, but if you have an API, it'd be good to have a look at it and I can have a chat with you about how we've designed ours. That's good. I, 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 I will share that with you. Awesome. Cheers. Uh, so the other one, which probably is a, just a quick one for Danny, uh, thoughts on if we're not an aggregator, should we subscribe to the subnet apart from being long lived? That's a good question. Um, so there's, there's, <clears throat> There's certainly immediate value in there. So our subnets, uh, if we don't do this, have grown much larger than we expected them to because of the cross-linking at every slot, uh, that change that came around DevCon. Um, so normally you would have, previously you would have subscribed to a subnet, maybe an Epoch Advance, but you don't have a bunch of other people in, the sim or in similar slots subscribing as well. So what this does is, um, 164th of all, approximately 164th of all validators are going to be subscribed to a subnet at any given time. And so these subnets are much larger than we originally intended them to be. Um, so if you're not an aggregator, that's actually very nice because you can just um, send to the, it's called the fan out, right? Um, and not worry about uh, actually receiving those messages and just the aggregators and the persistent uh, will, those persistent will receive the messages. The one downside that's worth considering is that um, these validators don't then immediately kind of get weight to their fork choice through the individual attestations they would have seen. Um, so there's a little bit of latency and a, a higher dependency on the um, aggregators to show up and do their work to add to that like sub that committee's fork choice, um, like group fork choice. That said, the persistent committee is going to be updating their fork choice and the aggregates are going to be sent, um, the aggregates are randomly selected and they're going to be sent um, on a public channel very soon, you know, within four seconds. So my intuition is that this is actually a, a great change. Um, and I will think about it a little bit more, but open to co other comments now. It's actually something that has been in the back of my mind uh, is, is, you know, can we make these subscriptions more granular so that you're uh, <clears throat> modifying the protocol such that you're only participating in a subnet on a particular slot? But this actually, I think, removes any of that complexity that I've been subtly chewing on. So, so we define by slot instead of epoch now? Is that the plan? No, no, no. So the, the idea is um, if you are an aggregator, you actually join, you subscribe to the subnet. So you receive messages from that subnet. Um, if you're not an aggregator, instead you just find peers on that subnet and publish to them. So that if you're part of a committee, you generally just publish your message the persistent committee is going to see it very quickly and the aggregators are going to see it very quickly and then publish aggregates on the main, on the main uh, channel. If you're an aggregator, you actually are going to be, be seeing all those granular messages and, and form your duty. So this saves a little bit on bandwidth um, and also just reduces the size of these, um, these nets. Okay, thanks, that makes sense. Yeah, so one of the other problems that I mentioned is that we don't know uh, the long-lived bit fields or just the bit field from the ENR for peers that connect to us. And I think we should have a mechanism that gets us that. This is, I mentioned this in the last networking call. Has anyone had any thoughts on this? I made a, I made a PR which has some comments on it, which uh, introduces also a ping protocol, uh, mm -hmm. which is a, just a draft. I'm not sure if people have got thoughts about that. So yeah, a little bit uh, yeah, I would agree with that. So, because uh, if you don't have like any sort of uh, timeout, or we know when to connect for how long to a particular subnet, it's, uh, you can't like differentiate between an you know old ENR or one that is new and so on. So, I, I think it it will help a lot. In HGC, if only aggregators are joining subnets, um, you still there's 
it's still worthwhile having the persistent at a state persistent subnets passed along because you can still make slightly better decisions on your peers, correct? Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. I think we need the the persistent ones. So my intuition when I was reading the ping protocol is that instead of sending the ENR sequence number, sending some sort of local identifier with respect to just your your node in general, um, and the payload if that changes is the ENR plus potentially other local information that might have changed. So it's a, a kind of a, a meta sequence number um, so that this ping protocol becomes useful beyond just the ENR if we want it to be. Um, thoughts on that? Yeah, sure. I, uh, the, 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 the small details I expect to kind of change and I'm happy to you know do some iterations on the PRs, kind of mainly fishing for whether firstly, do we agree, do we all agree that we kind of need or we want a, a ping RPC method? And uh, do we want to be able to like have an, a dedicated ENR method or do we want to try and just take the bit field out and try and chuck it in the status message or something like that? I think they're the, the two main kind of ways we could go. Great. I mean, in the ticket I argued for a separate ENR message simply because it's a big blob of data and technically we don't need ENR to run or would it be nice if, if the two protocol remain separate from a hard requirement on ENR even if it's kind of in the spec right now then it would be nice if you could run the rest of the protocol without ENR it's really there they bring in peripheral stuff that is not really needed for 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 it to itself. I guess this is something a bit of a design decision, right? I mean, we were there last time in the last call. Uh, I'm not sure if it was the networking call or the general uh, if two implementers call, but we just did discuss it uh, a little bit. Uh, this this question of like should the uh, node metadata be related as ENR or something else. And uh, I think we just need to make the decision. <clears throat> well, there's two levels, right? So when, one thing is whether we relay some data over ENR for, for, for the PR lookup. And then there are like in protocol needs when you're already connected. Yeah, um, so I, I, I think that like for real time in protocol information exchange, ENR is not really like the, the best format also because it uh, is always has to be signed so it's something that like the signature and the ENR is uh, very important uh, when the record is relayed because it protects the record in transit uh, and also when it is stored uh, in some other location but so it, it cannot be modified in transit but uh, since if you are connected to a peer directly, you already have an authenticated session with that peer. So any updates that peer is sending are, first of all, more recent than whatever could be in the ENR that you found earlier. And also, uh, since it's authenticated, you can trust the peer to tell you the right things about itself. So it's kind of uh, okay uh, not to sign this information. So I think uh, ENR itself is nice, uh, but it's really more for relaying information about the node. Uh, outside of the uh, real-time communication session that you have with the node. Uh, that said, in discovery, it's a bit different, of course, but it's kind of like, uh, in general, I agree with you that using ENR as a way to like uh, relay some uh, application-specific metadata is uh, in protocol, it's, like, it's not the best way. I think it would be better to define some other protocol message for that and not have the signature and things like that. Gotcha. So there's two paths there, as Adrian pointed out. The we have one thing that we want. We know we have one uh, item that's persisted that we want to relay, um, which we can drop with the attestation subnets, which we can drop into the um, into the status message. Or um, assuming that there might be other semi-persistent. Uh, information that we want to relay, relay every once in a while, we can do essentially a node sequence number that is dropped into a ping 
that's just kind of bounced back and forth every once in a while. And if I notice it changes, then I can request for the larger payload. Right now, the larger payload would be the attestation subnet. Um, it could also be other uh, other information that was in the ER or other information uh, in general. Um, so one thing we, that I, yeah, go on. so one thing that would be quite nice is to make this the format of whatever this message is to make that uh, like yeah to basically define that format uh, in a way that allows it to also be transported in uh, through other means. So one thing that uh, will definitely come uh, to this B5 in the near future, I think it will be optional, uh, is this uh, idea of having the like pre-connection uh, negotiation. So kind of basically like a way to exchange um, arbitrary uh, application specific information uh, through the discovery network session. So this is not the same as doing, you know, like, you know, doing everything over the discovery, but it's more like if you want to connect to a certain peer, it's good sometimes to be able to figure out in real time if this connection is really going to be worth it. And this is what the pre-connection negotiation is for. And uh, if you have a, a way to encode um, additional metadata beyond what goes into the ENR, uh, then this format could also be ideal for the pre-connection nego negotiation. So I would really uh, appreciate if it could be defined in a sort of like separate section of the spec to just have this like peer uh, metadata object. Right, right. And this would also be an ideal place to relay things like uh, the full list of like uh, hashes for something or like a list of gossip subtopics or whatever you need. I don't know, like basically yeah. things too big to fit into a single ENR. Got it. Um, I guess another question, uh, the, do we, we all want a ping protocol, correct? Like, some very lightweight message just saying, yo, what's up? Um, uh, I think I we need it because at, at the moment we don't have uh, a way that if peers kind of just drop out uh, to identify that. Shouldn't that be at the lib P2P level? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, what is, what I is, think what it's is, an application. Yeah. Sorry, can yeah, you synthesize this this point? <laughs> I tuned out for a minute. So what I've seen anyway in in Rust P2P, there's a there's an IPFS ping, which pretty much does a very similar ping to what we're suggesting here, um, which can check for peer liveness. Uh, we haven't specified any other lib P2P protocols apart from um, apart from the RPC that we've built and gossip sub, which have like these long lasting streams. So identifying when peers kind of drop out. I think we kind of need a ping protocol. So if the underlying transport is TCP, uh, which is the case right now, because we haven't really adopted quick, I, I'm, I'm not aware of implementations that have adopted quick yet, uh, then this should be part of the, so if a peer is connected to you, it means that the TCP connection is alive and we do run keep alives on that connection anyway. So there are TCP keep alives that are happening. Um, so basically when a peer drops out, you would be getting, if, if the Rust implementation is, is behaving properly, you should be getting a disconnected notification immediately when the connection dies. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, it's not something so like, I have to check that. So one thing that I can say to that is that uh, it's not always a good idea to rely on the TCP uh, level keep alive because TCP keep alive is uh, something that you cannot influence and it might also get, you know, like there, there can be issues with that. So it's like the TCP keep alive is kind of a last resort option and you cannot really influence the timing of it. So in, 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 in like you can, but it might not be respected. Like it's kind of TCP keep alive is, so can can sometimes also fail and and it's something that is it yeah, is it's yeah. much easier to do at, at the at the application level so in the dev p2p uh, transport protocol the way we do we do it is basically that we do have this like ping and pong messages which are sent if no other message is sent for 20 seconds or something and uh, it's basically 
it's much easier to just put it in your application protocol because uh, if you do it, first of all, you can use it to relay other information like the ENR sequence number or the metadata sequence number that you were talking about. But also, basically, it will give you, uh, it will assure your your node that basically the peer connection is indeed alive and you and you, you can have an basically authenticated uh, liveness signal that is uh, way, way stronger than just relying on sort of like the underlying internet infrastructure to do this for you. Like I would rec I would really recommend putting it into the application protocol because then you can really be sure that, you know, like your, uh, your keep alive mechanism is working and not, you know, like mangled by some middle box or whatever. Yeah, I think that's, uh, you do make a valid point, uh, Felix. Um, like, personally, I'm not 100% sure of what the assurance is in terms of, like, you know, the wider internet infrastructure in terms of the, the keep alive um, actually getting delivered. Um, and what I, so there are a, other layers in the lib 2 p stack, particularly the multiplexer, the Yamex multiplexer does run pings and it is a lazy ping. So it's, you know, a liveless ping is essentially just like you described. If there is a message that goes out anyway in application payload, then the ping, you know, reset and basically the, every me application level message resets the, the ping timer. So it's only, it's only used when, when there is a period of inactivity uh, that it, but this could be, uneven across multiplexers because I think that the Mplex multiplexer uh, does not run keep alive. So yes, if you do see a benefit of using a ping payload at the application level to transmit in the future, like some other control message or some other metadata message or whatever, could be useful. Yeah. Um, but I, I, no. basically the two points are, I don't know about TCP keep alives uh, in general. I think we have seen them work well, but it is also true that most of like IPFS, for example, and Filecoin do use Yamux, which also have that that ping mechanism. So I'm not sure if it's just the keep alive or the combination of both that you know makes this mechanism work well for reporting connection, you know, yeah. uh, connections that are killed immediately. So the thing about the TCP keep alive is that really the, the, the reason for TCP keep alive, why it exists in the first place is that usually when the connection is broken, uh, then there like when you close the TCP socket in, the, in, in your uh, user space uh, code or if your process exits, the OS will take care of like sending um, a, a TCP uh, level control message that will notify the other side that the connection is now over. And then basically the other side will in general receive that notification uh, and it will basically relay it uh, back into user space on the other on the other end of the connection so you will basically see the connection drop but um, the TCP keep alive is sort of uh, the, the intention for TCP keep alive is to take care of the case where one side basically gets firewalled off um, or uh, just drops out uh, because you know the battery runs out or whatever and then in that case no control message will be sent by the os because the os is dead so it's kind of uh, this is what the keep alive is for because if the keep alive extension is enabled on the tcp connection and is something that is negotiated during uh, tcp handshake um, the um, the uh, both sides will be waiting for you know like any message or you know like this like keep alive notification if nothing happens then basically the connection is also considered dead but the timeouts for this can be uh, really long and it's it's all a bit messy so if you do it in the application it's just safer and i think this this thing that you were describing is that having it doing this in the multiplexer is like a totally okay solution because it's really only needed to take care of this case where you know like the connection drops uh, due to a power outage or something Yeah. Uh, so, are, are you are you guys using in Rust and the rest of the implementations? Are you are you guys using a Yamex or Mplex? We have Yamex, and it falls back to Mplex. Um, mm. I, I've seen some interesting things on the test net, which is why I'm kind of proposing this, uh, where we just get like protocol negotiation timeouts. Uh, I have to. I probably have to track down these a little bit more detail as to the source of the problems. But Got it. Yeah. I think in these examples, I'm using Yamex, and I still find some weird things. So, 
potentially it's not just the ping. Potentially I should see disconnects as opposed to uh, what I'm actually seeing. But I can mm -hmm. I'll look at that. It's probably implementation specific. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, if I may, like I would also like like to recommend a, an experiment with using the IPFS ping protocol. Um, it's a protocol beyond just checking if the connection is still open. It actually, we'll use peer routing to find new uh, addresses for the peer if a disconnect happened beforehand. And so for the case that was uh, being highlighted, like someone changing the IP address because they changed the location, someone like changing from like regular ISP internet to some like 4G hotspot because the the ISP went down or something, um, the IPFS ping protocol will ask the network again and like real re-establish the connection. So it's beyond checking the connection open, it actually checks if the peer is still alive and running. Um, so so maybe yeah like checking that out and see if it, that like suffices for what you are looking for uh, would be good. Yeah, we'll take a look. I'm currently drawn to an application layer ping with a metadata sequence number. Um, and an RPC method for get metadata, uh, which would be just longer persisted data like attestation subnets um, and things that we want to share uh, like that. Is do people um, want to agree with exploring that? Yeah, so there's a template PR we can have a discussion on or remove yeah, and create okay. a new one. Cool, we'll take it there. Um, other further comments on this? And I will also take a look at the IPFS ping protocol, uh, which might serve as a uh, There's one thing, like um, we're talking about long lived data. Um, some of the data that's been mentioned as long lived might change at forks. Uh, so if we specify something that's called a hello message, we can't specify that it's just a hello message, like that it's only allowed to be sent on connection, basically. Right. Uh, I think that we'd want to just call this like a get metadata message and specify under which conditions you might ask for it. And even uh, leading up to a fork, you might ask for it. Yeah, exactly, and like not require that the clients uh, call it at a specific point in time either, because if they need the data, they will naturally do so when they need it, right? So there's no right. like I think in the hello message it said something like you know you have to send it on connection or something, so, so something like this, and like that. yeah, yeah, sure. probably not needed. Um, and I know there's a. A little bit of a desire to include um, like client information and version. I don't want to include that in the core protocol, but maybe in metadata we can leave a um, like as a requirement. Uh, but maybe in metadata we can have you know 32 bytes of crap. Somebody can just write to if they if they want to. Um, okay. Cool. Um, Adrian, is there anything else you wanted to bring up with respect to uh, some of these other items like discovery subnets? You mentioned that you're doing some things to quicken uh, being able to find uh, peers with certain things in their ENRs. Is there uh, anything worth sharing on that? Um, I can just tell you kind of the, some of the strategies that we're doing in case other people are, are building. Yeah, please things. do. Uh, maybe people have already got this by default, but uh, so firstly, we uh, we had a system where uh, like NATed peers could kind of get into the DHT. Um, we removed that pretty much by taking a larger majority uh, before you update like your ENR. Um, there was a there was a PR I also kind of uh, made to the to the spec, which means that our ENRs don't have to specify an IP address. So when you first create an IP, when you first create an ENR and uh, you're not sure that you have an externally con uh, contactable address, then you can kind of just leave the IP address out. So it's it's clearer to see that um, that your ENR is kind of either behind a NAT or hasn't found a way through the NAT. Um, there's a thing we we kind of borrowed from libp2p CAD, which is 
uh, in the queries, the find node queries. So in, in Discovery V5, there's, um, there's a timeout on your, on your UDP packets. Uh, for us, we also implement, because UDP is lossy, uh, we, we have the option to, to send mo packets multiple times after a particular timeout. Uh, originally in the one of the earlier versions of the implementation the the timeouts were were kind of quite large and when you're doing the query the query has usually a, a parallel parallelism parameter which allows you to you know send multiple queries find node queries to peers at, at any given time um, and for peers that were either disconnected or not not available on the DHT we, we kind of were waiting for this timeout um, before we we classified the, the peer as being non-contactable and, and, and going to the next one for the query to, pro, to, to kind of progress. Uh, so instead we, uh, we've added a, like a smaller timeout for like, a, it's kind of like a query timeout. So let's say that your, your UDP request has a timeout of four seconds, then there's a query timeout of like one second or two seconds, which after that period of time, you you don't consume your parallel, parallelism parameter. You keep asking more and more peers, but you still accept a response from other peers. So that, that kind of speeds up um, some of the find node queries. In terms of uh, in terms of looking for particular ENR fields, um, we decided that well, it's I guess it's still implementation specific. But um, in in one of our earlier versions, there's a particular the when, when you do a find node query to find peers, you the query finishes when either you found the maximum number of peers or you've exhausted the, the crawl. Um, in the particular case for subnets, we probably want to have queries that finish early. If we only need three peers or two peers, for example, you can you can specify the query to end when it's found a certain number of peers. Um, and also we kind of filter the peer list during the query for um, ENR fields as opposed to um, getting a chunk of peers finding out whether they match your ENR um, field and then, you know, re reprocessing the, re 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 redoing queries. Um, so they're, I guess, some of the main strategies we're going to try that will hopefully speed up our queries to find peers for subnets. Thanks, Age. Um, any questions for Age before we move on? Maybe I can just share one more thing, which is, can be like nice trick. Uh, so uh, the way I'm considering to do the uh, uh, like in Go Ethereum, what the way we do it with the with the discovery is kind of like the design is basically like iterator based. So you can kind of just get something like a never ending iterator of like nodes that you can pull from, and then when you pull from this iterator, it will just uh, keep advancing the lookup. And one thing I'm considering uh, to add very soon now is basically since the lookup implementation is uh, event driven and I think the one in Rust is as well it's kind of uh, actually there's not a big cost to just having many lookups uh, concurrently so basically one thing you can just do is you can just run like 50 uh, random lookups uh, concurrently because they're all just state machines and then if you want to limit the resources you can just put a, uh, a rate limiter on the number of outgoing packets or something like per second and doing that can give you a pretty broad scan of the network uh, at a configurable rate, which is something that I can really recommend doing uh, to like get uh, many candidates as quickly as possible. And um, also, I think that the uh, I hope everyone understood that. <laughs> yep. And um, the other thing is that. Um, I think that the change that was suggested by the Harmony team to uh, improve the find node to take multiple distances as the parameter will also uh, speed up these queries because you won't, will no longer have to send like up to three requests to uh, uh, find all the nodes that you might need. So the, the goal is really to like get uh, find as many nodes as fast as possible like it's the purpose of the protocol and basically anything we can put in the spec even to accelerate that is i'm i'm super happy about more suggestions got it thanks okay cool so um when you're working on this uh, consider some of these strategies to make uh, discovery of particular peers, of particular ENRs, uh, quicker. 
Um, there is in that E2O APIs, there's been some discussion on a uh, updated protocol between validator client and beacon node. Um, I know that Prismatic has their own set of APIs, so let's certainly cross pollinate those, make sure we're on uh, kind of using the best ideas. Um, peer management, uh, we're likely to do a ping with uh, metadata and define some sort of metadata uh, request. Um, and then on the aggregators, my intuition is that, uh, or for non-aggregators, my intuition is that the non-aggregators actually don't need to subscribe to subject subnets and just publish. Um, I think that's going to be a, a gain for us. So um, I will work on those two potential PRs with respect to ping and uh, redefining how you subscribe or not. Um, and otherwise, I think it's mainly working through some of the details. Um, I think some teams have worked through more of the details, so please talk to each other. Okay, anything else on this item? Abe? Sorry, uh, last I, thing. I have, yeah, sorry, you too. Okay, you go first. Okay, hopefully this is just really small. Um, uh, it, it got brought up in the in the agenda as well, is that uh, for beacon nodes that have validators attached, I think uh, my, my, my current thinking is that we, for the peers that are connected to us, we're going to pr prioritize connections with peers that have um, greater, the larger number of long-lived subnets. Does anyone have any concerns with, with doing that? So um, like, the, the, these peers will bootstrap the subnet, is it? Uh, so let's say we've got uh, like 10, 10 or 15 peers connected to us. Um, five of them are just normal uh, beacon nodes, as in that they're not validating, so therefore they don't really have any long-lived subnets attached to them. If I'm a validator, uh, I, I want to find peers that have uh, long-lived subnets so that when I have to perform an action on one of those subnets, uh, I, I've got a kind of a collection of peers that I know are already connected to that subnet, which saves me having to go and find more of them. So I, if, I, if I do go and find more uh, and I have a, a peer limit or I only have a finite number of resources, I'm going to kick probably peers that don't that aren't subscribed to any subnets in favor of ones that are, so that I don't have to do discoveries in the future. Sounds pretty pretty good to me. Yeah, it sounds like certainly the viable strategy as a validator. I think the the one concern um, which I think was brought up was if you have these like super nodes that are running tons and tons of validators and are subscribed to all subnets at all times, um, they might become um, kind of naturally become central uh, nodes in the network, uh, which is something to consider. I think we definitely want, you definitely want to have a diversity of peer uh, with respect to persistent subnets. Um, I'm concerned about having finding peers that have the maximal number of subnets, um, even though I know that is kind of like the best way to optimize that problem. Um, I'll think about it a little bit more. I also think it's kind of important not to be like, have the peer set be too static, simply for the reason that like, if you get locked into a particular set of peers and you keep optimizing that, then um, it can lead to a situation where it's very hard to join this club because- um, right. So it's, it's also something that like, but you can, this is something like, I guess in every implementation that you have to find like the good policy. Like if you, like you only have so many slots available for connecting to other nodes. So you might as well just, you know, like try to keep some of them available for, you know, like, I don't know, like more sort of like dynamic and experimental peer connections. So you, you actually do notice if there's like new good peers on the network. So my, my, my question was, hey. My question was that uh, from of, from the this V five implementers, how are people uh, handling the caching of nodes? <clears throat> Is do, do, do you in, guys in terms of the sessions? Not sessions, but I mean the like discovered nodes. So do I do are you keeping like persistent caches or in memory caches only or? Yeah. So we. For us, anyway, we uh, the discovery v five implementation itself just 
puts them in the in the in the routing table, uh, and then Lighthouse uh, when it shuts down stores it on disk and loads it back up on disk when it restarts. But this is only for the for the table. That's right. Okay. So one thing that you can totally do, and is something that ENR is also like optimized for, is that uh, it's actually totally fine for you to keep an additional sort of cache on disk of like a node records that you found because um, you can always fall back on, on, on those records in, in the future. I mean, they might be stale, but um, it's something that is uh, very, very valuable in Go Ethereum for us. It's like for on, on the Ethereum one mainnet to have this like nodes database where we basically store all of the nodes we find in level DB and um, basically means that when you start up, you already have a pretty complete view of the entire network. Uh, locally and all you kind of really have to do is just you know like keep adding to that or keep uh, re-verifying those notes you do kind of have to uh, expire notes from this cache from time to time like you can't just you know like keep accumulating node information forever because of churn but uh, it's definitely uh, very helpful to like keep uh, persistent caches uh, off the network for a longer time uh, because it will really really help with rejoining the network but also uh, yeah, just it just means that if you need to do queries for like, you know, like if you've already discovered a node on a particular subnet, like half an hour ago, uh, then probably if that node is really like interested in ETH2, it is still alive. So you might just, you know, connect back to it again. So if you just, I don't know if you guys are using something like SQLite or whatever, or LevelDB with a custom like index or something, you could totally just keep, you know, like an on, on disk index of like nodes uh, which are uh, on a particular subnet and, and then just try those. And you don't even need to hit the DHT for that. You basically, because you already found them a while ago. Like, yeah, it's also, a really good idea. We'll implement that. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Any other uh, questions for Felix or Age or otherwise? This is a great yeah. way to find out which validators are on which PICO node, by the way. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I had a question on uh, validator privacy. So uh, with currently how the subnets are like structured, it would be uh, pretty easy to like map a IP address to like a validator's public key because uh, because like the requirement is that uh, each attestation is unaggregated. So identifying like uh, one validator to a certain IP would be easy across like a period of few epochs. So is, is that something that we're expecting? It's certainly a known problem. Um, and uh, secret leader election and other things on the horizon are two uh, address some of these things um, and the decoupling of validator from node allows for validators to create more sophisticated setups where for example i might uh, publish attestations to one uh, node whereas i only publish my blocks to another node assuming i might get dos um, so certainly a bit hand wavy um, it is but very, very expected at this point to be able to de-anonymize the network. Thanks. Okay, moving on. Uh, Nicola, I took a look at your table. I don't know if I fully parsed it. Let's take a look at your table. Yeah. Uh, I sent in to the, to the chat. So it's something that we did uh, at ITCC just after our last call with Proto Lambda, Dimitri, Mikawa, and others. And the idea was, uh, let's be clear about the requirements so that uh, everybody can agree that they meet those requirements. And so it's Proto Lambda mainly that we propose this with the idea, for example, Typically on privacy, uh, is it possible to de-anonymize the network or not? Uh, with the initial target, that could be, well, let's see that if, 
if it is actually possible, and we expect that it will be possible with a plan. So then for phase two, we can decide on what to do. Uh, so there are just a, a few lines at the end of the day, uh, which it's about formalizing very high level things, like how many nodes do we expect to have in phase zero? Uh, and are we happy with 1,000 nodes? And what's the target for phase two? Could be 20,000 nodes. So, so the idea of this is really, can we find a place to have this kind of high level requirements in the specification and a way to say, okay, are we happy with those requirements and do we think that they can actually be met by the implementation and, uh, and protocols today? So it leads to two questions. I mean, do you feel that it's reasonable uh, in the people in the call? I mean, I, I mean, the, there's requirements, 1,000 nodes. Do you think that it can be done for phase zero? Uh, and uh, are you okay with the approach? Should we put this somewhere in the specification? Um, we can certainly take it to an issue for discussion um, and decide where we want it to live. Um, my intuition is that we'll certainly have on the order of 600 to 2000 nodes um, in early phase one. Um, and that's certainly one of the most under tested items at this point is uh, scaling nodes probably beyond the approximate 100 range. Yeah, and do you think that we should target 100 or do you think that we should target 1,000? Oh, certainly 1,000. 100 is the only thing we've seen, I think the max, approximate maximum we've seen on a test net, the prismatic test net so far. So that's, that's why I mentioned that number. Um, I think 1,000 is probably in the range of what we'll see, but I wouldn't be surprised if we saw two, three times more than that in early days. And are people around things that it's uh, we can achieve 3,000 nodes today, for example, at the aggregations or discovery, whatever? What's your intuition on that client team? So <clears throat> the I don't think any anyone has seen uh, bandwidth or finding peers or any of the networking components that we might be concerned about uh, be the bottleneck or main failure points at this point, um, which is good. But we've also only have 100, uh, 100 known networks. So um, I think there's, there's optimism, but a bit of an unknown quantity there. So do you think that we, should, we could put this somewhere in the specification? So they are known, and then we can establish test plans around this and these kind of things. Yeah, yeah. Um, why don't you port the table to an issue on the spec repo and we can go from there. Okay, I can do that. I actually drafted out sort of like a a test spec on how we could sweep the different parameters um, to, to figure out sort of like given the current configuration um, kind of where things start to break down. I can add a link. Um, you all can look at it. It's basically like define some stability and stress tests where you kind of sweep number of nodes, validators per node, um, total number of validators, um, obviously total number of nodes. Can I do it, I guess. And um, we're also working on a test net plan on the types of things that we need to see in test nets, uh, the type of stresses, the number of nodes, distribution of clients, um, that kind of stuff, which would 
also feed into validating some of these requirements. Anything else on this? Well, for the table. So point of the table also is to face the requirements. So not just mainnet, testnet, but try and define steps in between. So that actually does make sense to work towards it. And but we do have action points, we do hit some limits. All right, anything else on this? Anything else for Nicola? Okay, spec discussion. Um, we hit this a little bit in item three. Um, we definitely talked about the ping. Uh, we have a potential route forward, and we're going to take a conversation to um, that PR, maybe a PR that'll supersede it. Um, are there other spec related items? specifically day zero stuff that's going to affect us in the next few weeks that we want to talk about. Modifications, questions, issues, comments. Thanks. Yeah, I had, I had some questions regarding um, sort of the, the, the assumptions uh, um, beacon nodes should um, should kind of not on be beacon notation. You're breaking up really bad. Like I'm having trouble understanding what you're saying because of the latency. Okay. Maybe it was just me stuttering. No, no. <laughs> okay. I can hear you now though. Okay, so so basically, I, I just had some questions regarding what the expectation is on how um, on how beacon nodes are going to treat like light clients or other non beacon node uh, clients. Are gonna, um, there's a couple of places in the spec where it mentions reputation, um, and and I was curious specifically, like I, I would like a light client not to be able to um implement all so should beacon nodes gonna disconnect from a node that doesn't that doesn't implement all the um are they going to uh you know are are we gonna say that if a if a if a client can't adhere to all the musts um, should you disconnect? And if so, like, have we thought about like light clients? And... Right. So I, I saw some of that discussion online, and I, I think it's a valid discussion. Um, the must certainly have not been uh, thought about with respect to light clients in the past half months as we as we defined the spec. Um, are you still talking? I still hear like some cr crunching from your. Light no, clients. no. <laughs> okay, sorry. The latency keeps going in and out. Um, so I think it's worth doing a pass and see what is not viable. Um, I imagine that a lot of the must um, might be with respect to some of these uh, gossip sub validations. Um, exactly. On yeah. some of these subnets, especially the attestation subnets, the light client doesn't need to be a part of them at all. Uh, so those yeah. are those are out the window. Um, the block, the block validation and how light clients are getting blocked, I think is probably one of the biggest concerns as you brought up. Um, and I don't have the answer 
immediately. So I was talking to Mikhail about this and, and would um, polynomial commitments uh, be a solution to that? Um, a zero knowledge proof would be. Yeah. Uh, but there's okay. a solution to everything. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Hand wave, yeah. Okay. Yeah, but uh, certainly a, a sophisticated zero knowledge proof could tell you, um, hey, this actually is valid with respect to things that you do know. Um, but that, uh, that's not necessarily the path that we're gonna go. So I, you could certainly listen to these subnets and pick up blocks and just not forward them because you don't know if they're worth forwarding. Um, you could also, another path is actually not listening to these Beacon blocks being broadcast in real time because you can't actually do anything with them. Um, the light client sync protocol actually would probably be a separate protocol where I'm talking to some sort of light client server. Um, they provide me with the proof that advances me from uh, point A to point B, say skipping a day's worth of, or skipping an hour's worth of, of epochs or something. Um, at which point I have a finalized route and I just get data about the state. I actually don't know if there's any value in a, a light client doing a block sync um, and actually getting all of the blocks. Um, instead, they're kind of just skipping ahead. So the answer might be that a light client actually wouldn't participate in many of these protocols um, and is more just getting to advancing to checkpoints and at querying state with respect to those checkpoints. Um, that's kind of how the light client seek protocol is imagined today. And I don't know, I don't know the value beyond that to actually be participating in some of these subnets. Um, it actually would be nice because it, it reduces the bandwidth requirement um, and doesn't scatter light clients throughout your, um, your poor gossip, um, at least for the, the core consensus here. Are, so, we con are we concerned about being able to tell the difference between a light client and a, like a regular beacon node? Um, we're certainly concerned about uh, the protocols that a node speaks um, with respect to what I want to do with them. And so if a node shows up and doesn't, uh, can't handle all, all the things that I want, then I might disconnect from them. Um, <clears throat> either via the the ENR <clears throat> via the advertisement of some sort of protocol or a component of a status message um, that I imagine once we do have a light client sync protocol that that information will be readily communicated um, such that you're pretty aware of who you're talking to um, and if you're not a light client server and then you're not serving these uh, these proofs about how to advance um, to some point in the future. Uh, you very well might disconnect. Um, and the light client very well might, might disconnect to you from you as well because they see that you're not serving that protocol uh, and so you're not of any use to them. Um, these are all things that are being chewed on but have certainly have made their way into the spec. I think it's definitely worth doing a pass on the spec to see if there are any components that are we estimate are gonna be requisite for a light client um, that have any must that would make them uh, non-viable. Um, and I, I, I will do that. Okay. Um, do you mind if I open up an issue that maybe we could just kind of... Yeah, cool. We can try to enumerate any problems there. Okay, cool. Thanks, Danny. Yeah, and thank you. I've, it, you know, these two, the designing of the networking spec and the consideration of light clients from phase one of I haven't allowed those items to cross pollinate in my head. Yeah, totally. Um, other immediate thoughts on this item, like clients issues with PTP spec. I mean, another like sort of random thought um, is that if ultimately light clients and beacon, if we can tell the difference between them, um, 
I guess in my head, um, which is probably flawed, I, f I figured that, you know, the end state of the network, there, there would be, you know, swarms of light clients, um, you know, that help kind of uh, anonymize which nodes are actually validating nodes, you know, to kind of make it more difficult um, to find them. Um, but, but I guess, I guess that's not really, I guess that's sort of a problem already right now with ETH1, right? So it's sort of just business as usual. <laughs> it's a little bit business as usual. Yeah. Um, ideally, we can find light clients and light client servers better. Um, and uh, that we start this thing sooner or later with a good protocol. Um, the, in terms of swarms of light clients just kind of being embedded, uh, because they're almost certainly not going to take place in these kind of like consensus layer gossip protocols, uh, they probably wouldn't be too embedded deep in there um, because of the light client. But uh, nodes in general, just a node that wants access to the network that is running a full node can and, and would be embedded in some of these consensus layer, control layer uh, gossip topics. But even then, um, if I'm just a full node and I'm not validating, I very well might not join any attestation subnets um, and would instead just listen to, I, I might listen to aggregates, attestation aggregates. I might just listen to blocks because blocks are going to include a lot of information that I care about. Um, and as long as uh, you know, there's a majority of validators uh, successfully participating, it's very safe and I get the reduction of bandwidth. Um, so some of these subnets might only be com composed of primarily validators. Gotcha. Okay. Thanks, Danny. Okay. We're three minutes over. Um, any closing comments? Okay, uh, meet, stacked meetings this week. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the V011 uh, release that needs to drop ASAP. Um, the re-release of a of our phase zero um, bug bounty program and some other fun stuff. Talk to you all then. Thanks everyone. Yeah, thanks, thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Thanks.